So uh, thank you, Professor Kim, for the most interesting uh, discussion. So uh, I think he explained to us various studies that shows the neural correlates, neural level explanations of uh, some of these psychological constructs like motivation, curiosity, interest. And then you see the slide on the implications, right? I think you can start to think about questions to, to ask, you know, draw more implications on the re you know, relevance to classroom uh, teaching and learning later on during the Q&A question. So uh, let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Professor Roy Cohen Kardosh. He's coming. <laughs> He's professor of cognitive neuroscience at uh, the University of Oxford. His main research interest is on the psychological and biological factors that shape learning and cognitive achievements. We focus on uh, mathematical cognition and executive functions. So he used uh, different research techniques that vary from uh, cognitive assessment, mental chronometry, and diffusion models to neural imaging models that allow the examination of neurochemicals, brain structures, and functions. So he pioneers the use of brain stimulation to modulate neuroplasticity during cognitive training. So uh, I think in, in, he was sure that this helps to improve learning and cognitive achievement. So his unique multidisciplinary research has been recognized by a number of prestigious awards for originality, creativity, and uh, theoretical contribution in the fields of psychology, education, and neuroscience, including the Society of Neuroscience Career Development Award, the Spearman Medal from the British Psychological Society. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Kohen Kardosh. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I've been asked to uh, talk about educational Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, good. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about uh, educational neuroscience and numeracy. And this is the short title of what I was supposed to talk. Uh, this is the more long title of the, of the talk. So I'm going to divide it into uh, two parts that are going to be combined during the, the talk. The first one is what educational neuroscience can actually tell us about numeracy, okay, about uh, numerical and mathematical cognition. Uh, and the other thing which I think is uh, probably more interesting for the people who sit here is where there uh, we can uh, use that. What are the implications and application of the knowledge that gained in uh, this field to uh, the classroom? So the the, the, first, uh, the first thing is why we actually care about numeracy. So I know that you are all teachers and you care about your students and you want them to succeed. Um, and sometimes we look on the bottom line, which is they need to score high and we need to be the first in PISA and so on, right? But beyond that, if you're looking, so there are benefits of being numerate uh, both at the individual levels, which I'm sure you care, and also the society level, which I also think it's very important. So it has been shown that low numeracy is associated with poor educational progress, with lower socioeconomic status. Um, it can actually predict your socioeconomic status uh, 35 years um, after that, based on your uh, numerical abilities at the age of seven, for example. Um, it also can lead to unemployment, low salary, uh, poor mental and physical health, which much more interesting, it's more applicable in this case to female than male. So there are gender differences into the, applica in, into the implication of being low numerate. Um, in addition, it has been associated with financial difficulties, uh, probably due to problems in financial uh, planning in this case. And at the societal level, uh, for example, it has been shown that uh, improving numeracy is associated with uh, better indices, uh, economical indices, such as, for example, the GDP. 
So now we know it's important to be numerate. I didn't tell you uh, much about that, I guess. I didn't tell you something new. And I would like to talk now on three examples how educational neuroscience um, has the potential to contribute to uh, numeracy. And I'm going to divide these examples into um, three fields that educational neuroscience can contribute you can even divide it even more than three, uh, but I'm going to focus on three. The first one is neuro-understanding. And um, here the idea is how um, neuroscience can allow us to have a better biological understanding of numerical learning. The um, other, the second one is neuro-prediction. Whether neuroscience can allow us to have predictors, and I'm not talking here about cognitive predictors, so for example, running uh, fluid intelligent tests and predict achievements, but how uh, the brain can allow us to predict the uh, learning outcome, who's going to benefit, for example, from um, a giving training. And the third one uh, is neurointervention, where there uh, neuroscience can allow us to affect the brain in order to improve learning. We a lot of time try to, we, you a lot of time try to affect the brain of your students. And how did you do that? It's in the most traditional way. You talk to them, you show them, you try them to learn, you try them eventually to change their brain by doing that. But this might not be, if you think about it, this might not be the most beneficial approach. It's a rather indirect approach to change the brain. And if we have neuroscience at our side that can allow us to target the brain and change it, especially in those that we cannot change their brain because they have atypical development, they have learning difficulties, maybe we could make eventually a better outcome from uh, the educational practice. So I would start with neurounderstanding. I just have to say these three examples that I gave, they're not independent. Okay, just, I think it's important to say, they all based on each other to some degree, okay? They don't, they're not isolated. I think to really have good understanding and good science and eventually good practice, you need to have all three. Uh, so neuro-understanding. So neuro-understanding, um, just to give you the, the longer definition, would allow us to use biological knowledge uh, in order to have eventually a better understanding why people are able to learn better, and why people sometimes struggle. Um, one example I would like to provide here in, in, in this slide is on arithmetic learning. And we know uh, that arithmetic learning at the beginning is based on algorithmic processing, that with time, with pra practice, it's become, it becomes automatic, and you retrieve information uh, by rote, okay? You have a direct uh, retrieval of this information. And this is a, an experiment showing uh, that uh, there are different brain regions that are associated as a function of arithmetic solving. So in this experiment, they had um, participants uh, from um, um, childhood till uh, young adulthood, and they assess how the brain functions when they gave them to solve arithmetic problems. What they found is that there is a negative, uh, sorry, a positive correlation between age and brain activation in this case. So the older you are, these are the areas that are involved that are more related to direct retrieval, okay? These participants uh, retrieve the information without applying um, algorithmic processing. They do not need to calculate. They can retrieve it already by heart because they have much more experience. This is in the case of negative correlation. So these are the areas that are involved mainly by kids, okay? These are more frontal regions that are involved in intentional, effortful processing that are need in order to uh, come eventually to the right solution of the arithmetic problems that they show them. So this allows us to know that there are different brain regions that are involved uh, as a function of expertise, as a function of age. Uh, and as a function of the cognitive process that are involved during arithmetic processing. This is another example. This is uh, what happened to the brain of young adults, okay? 
when they are shown arithmetic facts. At the beginning, they need to calculate those facts, but with time, so when they calculate those facts, they are novel versus repeated. But with time, when they are repeated, there are other brain regions that start now to activate to the same problem. So when they are not practiced, um, what you could see is that there are the red spots in the frontal part of the brain that are involved. This is when this information is unique, okay? When they are practiced, they can retrieve the same problems already by heart. They don't need any more to compute it. And this is where more posterior regions are taking place. So even at a short time scale, so this is across, um, what, a bit more than five minutes, yeah? There, are, there is already changes in how the brain process information that relates to arithmetics. So fast changes in this case. This is uh, another example, and here I'm showing you uh, on the y-axis uh, neurochemicals. So we are a lot of time interested in how the brain functions. But the building blocks a lot of time of how the brain functions relate to the chemistry of the brain, okay? And the brain works on neurochemicals such as, for example, in this case, glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is an excitatory neurochemicals, excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA is inhibitory neurotransmitter. So one excites the brain in very basic general level. One excites the brain, one inhibits the brain, okay? And you need to have a good balance between two because the, ch the relationship between those neurochemicals can define how the brain changes how much the brain is plastic. You want the brain of your students to be plastic. You want it to change, okay? And what you find here is that the level of glutamate versus GABA, so the more excited it is compared to um, inhibit, um, is in relationship with the standardized MATS test, okay? So it's in, in a positive correlation. The, um, the higher the glutamate versus GABA, the higher the scores, this is a rank, correlation, the higher the score is on a standardized maths test. And this is specific to the frontal part of the brain. This is in case of children between the age of eight and 10, okay? So the more you want to think about it, the more probably plastic the brain, the more they are able to perform on uh, standardized maths test. Whether this is, can really predict how they're going to perform in the future is something that we're examining at the moment, but it is quite interesting to see that there is a relationship in the frontal regions, but not relationship in the more posterior regions that are more involved in direct retrieval. When you're becoming more experts in this case, you have a similar correlation when they need to do even a basic numerical skills. So not something that involves in a, a, a higher order um, math. So based on this knowledge, there are uh, models that tells us that uh, areas in the frontal and areas in the posterior, in this case it's the intraparietal sulcus, which I did not discuss it in great details, are involved in our algorithmic processing, while areas that also in the parietal, and I show them a bit more here, are involved in direct retrieval. Okay, so we know that there is, to some degree, uh, a division, uh, in this case, in the brain that is, depends whether you are already trained or you are receiving a training with numerical and arithmetic uh, material. So, uh, based on studies from other domains, in this case, from uh, dyslexia and autism, we know that um, we can have a better understanding of neurodevelopmental disorder. And um, it has been suggested that the source for these neurodevelopmental disorders is rooted at the neural level. I have to say, it's something that it still needs to be confirmed. People sometimes run into conclusions. Most of these studies are based on correlational approach, okay? You can never know if there is a problem in the brain at the beginning, or the problem emerged because of other cognitive capacities that might relate to other areas. And this, of course, leads to the question whether we can improve uh, the understanding of atypical mathematical 
um, abilities uh, like dyscalculia based on educational uh, neuroscience findings. And if we can also provide, this is another side of the coin, if we can also know why those who really outperform others, why those who really achieve high, what, how does it relate to their brain? And I focus so far on those who are average population. Let me show you some slides on that, also on atypical uh, development. So um, there are, th this is, I think, I, I like this quote. Um, you could say there are three types of people in the world, my friend, those who are good at maths and those who are not. Okay, and um, this is indeed what the, the scientific community did so far, okay? Uh, we consider there are two types of people, those who are good with numbers, those who are not good with numbers. And I think that this is actually a wrong approach. Um, this is um, coming from a, a handbook that I edited on numerical cognition, and uh, it shows studies that uh, found differences between those with dyscalculia, okay, maths learning difficulties, and those who are non dyscalculic. And you could see that the regions that they highlighted mostly is the uh, parietal regions in the posterior part of the brain. And in green, you could see it's uh, reduced gray matter, okay, in the case of those with developmental dyscalculia. Okay, this is the intraparietal sulcus. It's a key region in numerical cognition. Now, when we took um, people who are mathematicians, okay, put them in the, inside the scanner and want to see what we find in those who are academics, mathematicians, compared to academics who are non-mathematicians, okay? they all really smart people. They are all, by the way, at the University of Oxford. <laughs> uh, I think you can find maybe better mathematicians on Cambridge and or maybe UCL. <laughs> And here you have gray matter density, okay? Higher means that there is more gray matter, okay, in, their, in, the, in, in, in this region. So we look on the superior parietal lobules, IPS, and IFG. This is the superior parietal part. This is the IPS that has been shown to have lower gray matter density in the case of dyscalculia, okay? And this is the IFG. So this is what you find in the right superior parietal lobule, okay? Mathematicians have more gray matter than uh, controls, okay? This is what you will find usually when you compare control to dyscalculic. So dyscalculic should have less. But this is what happened when you look on the intraparietal sulcus, okay? <coughs> Mathematicians have lower gray matter than controls. If you will replace, if you will show this graph to someone in numerical cognition and replace here mathematicians with dyscalculia, they will say this is how it should look like. Okay, so actually the pattern that you see, it's that mathematicians show a pattern that is compared to control, show a pattern that is similar to those with dyscalculia. And this is what you have in the uh, right inferior frontal gyrus, also less gray matter. I'm not going to discuss that, this one. But I think what you can get from here is that you can really not draw at this stage a conclusion between how the brain is and whether someone has a problem, okay? It's, um, it, it's something that we still do not have a, a good understanding because we focus so far on average versus uh, those who have problems. And the question is what happened also to the other extreme, to really get a full picture of what's happening. We're just so far looking on a very uh, selective part from a picture. Um, the other issue I've so far focused on um, MRI findings, because these are the most of the findings so far. And as a neuroscientist, you usually focus on these measures because you more care about basic research than look on translation. But these measures I showed you have really, I think, um, low ecological validity when it will come to classroom and practice. So, so most of them are based on small number of subjects. And I'm talking about between 10 to 20 plus. Um, this is nothing when you're thinking about translation. Then you will need to have really big sample size. And I'm going to return to this point later. Um, let me give you some one study about neuroprediction. It's one study basically because there is, there is not much there. 
there is a lot of neuro understanding, but when you're talking about neuro prediction, there is not much. There is starting to be now more and more studies that I know in the pipeline, also by, by my group. Uh, but this is the a study that already been published. Uh, so the, um, the experimenter here uh, gave to the children eight weeks of intervention, okay? And what do they want to see is whether there are areas in the brain that can predict the gain from the intervention. So they, get, they measure the performance gain based on how, how do they perform after the intervention compared to before the intervention. Higher values indicate more gain, okay? They perform better, they, they gain more from the intervention. And this is the gray matter volume in the hippocampus, okay? The hippocampus is uh, an, important, an important area that it's related to memory and also to retrieval of information. And the performance gain here was selectively on retrieval of arithmetic facts. What you see is that the higher gray matter the participant have before they start the intervention, predict how much they're going to gain. Those who had more gray matter there gain more from the intervention compared to those who had low gray matter. So it means that um, gray matter in the hippocampus could be a predictor of a particular type of intervention, in this case, um, uh, direct retrieval. And also the link between the hippocampus to other parts of the brain because no brain part is an island. They all need to connect with others, okay? So the connectivity of that with other brain regions um, could also predict the gain from the training. So um, one of the important things I would like to emphasize about this study is that the, um, the prediction here based on the neural measures was better than the prediction based on cognitive measures, okay? So it added values above and beyond the cognitive measures that was um, received. Actually, uh, if I'm the, the behavioral markers that they had here did not predict the intervention. In this case, it was only the neural measure. There is another study uh, published this year by uh, NEMI uh, from torkel Klinberg lab showing that both behavior and neural measures can provide better predictions than behavior measures alone. So there is something important at the neural level that can explain us and predict behavior that it is uh, unique and can allow us more information than just behavior itself. And I think it's something that it is important to bear in mind. Um, so the uh, part of the problems that I would uh, like just to mention is very similar to the one that I gave about neuro understanding. Uh, again, to predict how a student going to perform is very important. But when we come to the classroom, to put every person that you have in MRI scanner is not something we could really think about. Um, it's a problem in terms of where the scanner is. It's a problem in terms of costing. It's a problem based on the analysis that it is much more complex. And there are more mobilized tools that are now more and more easily can be implemented in a classroom setting or even outside of the classroom setting, but in the school. So neuro intervention uh, is the uh, last example. And here we want to use neuroscientific methods to affect mathematical performance um, and uh, learning. So one of the methods that I'm biased toward, because this is what my lab is doing uh, as part of the work, is electrical stimulation. And here when I'm talking about electrical stimulation, is nothing painful, is not painful, it's low current, it's considered safe. Uh, when you give it to uh, participants, and we had a pilot study on children, they did not, they could not tell that they received the stimulation because you use very low doses. Still, it's very low doses because your brain is working on very low dose. And what it caused to the brain, it doesn't cause to the brain cells to fire. It just caused them to change the thresholds. And the brain, in order to fire, needs to reach this, this threshold. So you can just think about runners that need to get to a 100 meter line, okay? And you get those, the idea is to take those who have learning difficulties and get them a bit 
closer to the finish line, so it will be easier for them to cross. Okay, just think about this on the brain cell. That need to go all the way, it doesn't cross. If the brain cell cross and fire, then there are changes that happens in the brain that relates to neuroplasticity. Then the brain will start to change, okay? And this is the idea behind that. There are different ways nowadays that we can stimulate the brain. There are ways that we can just change and make the brain more excitable or less excitable, okay? We can, take the, we can make the runners, rather than close to the line, just take them a bit back, so just to make it harder to the neurons to fire. There are ways that we can um, change how the brain works based on frequencies, because the brain works on a certain frequencies based on the cognitive abilities, so based on the cognitive function that they are doing. So we can even cause the brain to work at a certain frequency that is associated with the cognitive function that we would like to, to change. Now I just want to say, it's not electrical stimulation itself that's going to make the magic. It's actually the electrical stimulation needs to be, to be targeted to the right brain region, and it also needs to be coupled with training, okay, or with intervention. Because just alone, it's not going to change anything in a significant manner. You can just take the analogy from another field, from steroids, in order to change your, how your body looks like, right? If you're going to take steroids and sit in front of the TV, you're not going to get strong body. You need to go to the gym, you need to practice, then it will lead to changes. And it's the, a very similar concept, I would say, in this case. So these are results coming from um, um, our lab on young, healthy adults. So these are university students. Uh, that we gave them a different arithmetic uh, learning task. So this is, for example, calculation learning. Uh, this is drill learning. And in both cases, those who receive stimulation called uh, TRNS, uh, had a faster learning, steeper learning compared to sham. Okay, so they were able to reach the asymptote, which is considered to be uh, the learning, uh, the learning achieved faster than those who received sham. And this was both for if they were learn calculation problems or drill problems that they had to just retrieve by heart um, rather than an algorithmic process. Now the important issue is that the Stimulation doesn't have just an effect when you stimulate and it's gone afterward. This is what you usually find with drugs, for example, that you all the time need to give the drugs in order to uh, cause to change in performance. So for example, children with ADHD, if you would stop to give the Ritalin, they will not going to um, perform as with the Ritalin. But what happened here is that because we are changing the brain, because we're causing neuroplasticity here, when you um, asking your participants to come later, six, in this case, six months later, do the same type of problems as before. Now, without stimulation, you find that those who receive stimulation in, in, in blue perform better. These are reaction times to just perform faster. Whether it's on the problems that they saw six months before, but also on new problems. They are able to generalize it, to transfer it to new problems that they did not see before. It doesn't happen in all the cases. Yeah, this is for drill problems, okay? If you teach by drill, you don't find long-lasting effects, okay? Which might relate to different uh, factors. For example, the, the level of processing, the level of learning. Calculation requires much more deeper learning and understanding of the operations behind it, while drill is something that relates to a much more shallow uh, level of processing. Now, this is uh, another study that uh, we, we um, run, this is with uh, Marinella Capelletti uh, from Goldsmiths, and what that we found there is that very similar results. So these are when they need to discriminate between numerosity. Uh, you have um, dots on one side, dots on the other, and you need to decide where there are more dots, okay? Uh, this is something that people assume, reflect, and can predict numerical development. I do not agree with that, but I just want you to see here. Lower values indicates better discriminability between quantities, okay? And when you stimulate the parietal lobe plus training, this is this line, you find the best results, okay? This is five days of training, and then you have, um, you're, measuring the, you're measuring the performance four weeks after, eight, 12, and 16 weeks 
after the training without stimulation now, yeah? You see that there is a steeper learning for those who receive the stimulation compared to those who receive training alone or uh, stimulation only or um, stimulation to the motor cortex that is not involved primarily in numerical cognition, you don't find beneficial effect. You need to know where you stimulate in order to find the beneficial effect. And again, they are learning to steeper learning and to better performance, long lasting performance now without stimulation. It's just like if you want to think about it like scaffolding. You build the brain, you take the scaffolding, and it should perform better. And this method uh, can be used at school. So this is a, a, a small pilot that we run. This is the children uh, play the basic numerical game to improve their basic numerical skills. These are children, I have to say, with uh, dyscalculia. Uh, and you have nowadays a wireless uh, stimulator devices that can also record DEG as well. Uh, and they perform um, while, uh, they, they receive the simulation while they perform uh, the task. So, um, in respect to neuro intervention, it shows uh, promising results by different labs. I just showed some from mine and uh, the one from Marinella. Uh, however, the results, I have to say, mostly are restricted to young, healthy adults. There are now some uh, more uh, studies, proof of concept studies, on, for example, ADHD uh, and also on dyslexia uh, and ours on dyscalculia that try to assess whether this is a promising avenue to uh, use um, educational neuroscience, the neuroscience in educational context. So I would like to summarize. Um, educational neuroscience informs us a lot about numeracy in multiple levels, okay? Um, however, I would say that the applied part is still lacking to some degree. Um, and this is due to uh, different factors. Uh, first of all, the methods that are used by uh, neuroscientists um, are not suitable so much in a school setting. It doesn't mean that it cannot be used in a school setting. The methods need to be adjusted. And I think when there is a collaborative work, then you think about what methods could be actually brought to school. Because you use uh, scientists using methods based on their questions. A good scientist, at least. So there is a possibility to choose different methods or to come up with different methods that will be suitable for a school context. The other issue is relatively small sample size. And this is because with methods like MRI and for answering basic questions, usually a sample size between 20 to 30 would be enough. But this is not what happened when you think about education, when you think about the variability that you have there. Individual differences is a big factor. Uh, that we know it nowadays, and this is why a large sample size that can be gained by working together is something desirable that can not only benefit uh, those who are involved more with the education, but can also inform a lot from neuroscientific perspective. So there is a gain here that both could have. Uh, the other issue is lack of funding, and it is relatively lack of funding. There is much more emphasis from neuroscience on basic research, based on translation, uh, while I would say there, it's probably the other way around when it comes to education. However, neuroscience work is usually more expensive than education work. So this is, I think, there are walls that each one can run into. Uh, and the other issue is lack of real multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary collaborative research. There is a headache, right? If you need to come up and meet with the other side, you need to give up sometimes a lot on your perspectives, a lot on what you could maybe achieve alone. But in order to really lead to a real change, this is something that should be encouraged much more in order to do that. I, I listed all of these things. Um, I have to say, they're all achievable. They're all problems that are important to detect, but I'm not one to be here pessimistic and say they cannot be changed. They definitely can be changed with the right people in place. I would like to thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you, Professor Kuhn Kadosh. I think you painted a, a nice snapshot of the state of the art of uh, educational neuroscience. I think uh, I'm very fascinated with the neuro interventions and uh, you know 
uh, imagine your tuition centers putting the kids on these TS caps. <laughs> I, I think we have a lot of, uh, uh, you can think of questions to, uh, to, 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 for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kardosh.